Not news, but something Daniel might love to take a piss on. Like the book talk one. Wait, what? Brandon Sanderson is your god. Is this like a huge Sanderson fan? He's the biggest fantasy writer in the world. He's also very Mormon. Okay. These things are profoundly related. Most years, Brandon Sanderson makes about 10 million. Last year, he made 55 million. This is obviously a lot of money for anyone. For a writer of young adult-ish, never-ending speed writing fantasy books, it's huge. By Sanderson's estimation, he's the highest-selling author of epic fantasy in the world. On the day of his record-breaking Kickstarter, 42 million of that 55 million, I came to the Wired office ready to gossip. How'd he do it? Why now? Is he even a good writer? Nobody had the first clue who or what I was talking about. On the other hand, who cares? Sanderson has millions upon millions of fans all over the planet. See, th this is something people used to say about Sanderson that I just don't find to be true anymore. Most people have heard the name Brandon Sanderson by now. Um, even outside of the super nerdy circles I run in, people are aware of who he is. Okay, I just disagree with that sentiment. On the other hand, the ignorance goes far beyond wired. As far as I can tell, Sanderson, who has been topping bestseller lists for the better part of the 21st century, has not been written about in any depth by any major publication ever. I called his publicist to confirm this. Well, we have a piece coming up in LDS Living, he told me. That, yeah, Latter-day Saints. It's a magazine for Mormons. But first of all, I don't think his publicist would confirm that. Sanderson's been written about in major publications repeatedly. Weird. Uh, which makes sense. Sanderson's extremely Mormon. Okay. I don't... Has Sanderson ever classified himself as extremely Mormon? Or has he ever done anything to seem like he is in the extremes of Mormonism? What makes less sense is why there's a hole the size of Utah where the man's literary reputation should be. What the fuck are you talking about? It is because he mostly writes fantasy, a, so the sobs, snob sneer, sub-literary genre. Okay, good. So, yeah, they're making fun of the fact that, like, people are snobby against fantasy, which is stupid. But then, again, so did J.K. Rowling, Margaret Atwood, and George R. R. Martin, and their household names. It is because none of Sanderson's work have been adapted in the screen? Well, he wrote three of the Wheel of Time books, and an adaptation of that series came out on Amazon Prime in 2021. Yeah, but he didn't author the parts of the story that was about, and also had nothing to do with the show, and also his name was attached to zero of the marketing. That... Okay. Could it be, finally, because he's a weirdo Mormon? That's offensive. Uh, but also, are, so, so are Orson Scott Card and Glenn A. Larson and Stephanie Meyer. Mormon, I mean. Only Scott Card is also a weirdo. Also a weirdo? This person just called Brandon Sanderson a weirdo for his faith. I'm not a religious person, but I have the modicum of respect to not say something like that, which is just a dick move, but all right. Sanderson, when I eventually meet him in person, makes versions of these excuses plus others for his writerly obscurity. Do we have any actual quotes on that? It's kind of fun to talk about until it isn't. And that's when I realize, in a panic, that I now have a problem. Sanderson is excited to talk about his reputation. He's excited, really, to talk about anything. But none of his self-analysis is, for my purposes, exciting. In fact, at the first dinner over flopsy Utah Chinese, days before I meet his extended family and attend his fan convention and take his son to a theme park and cry in his basement, I find Sanderson depressingly story-killingly lame. This person's writing an article that so far is just basically saying they do not like Sanderson as a person, and they find the fact that he's excited to talk about his fantastical works obnoxious. As you guys know, because I was on his channel, I went to Sanderson's house in Utah and talked with him and met his team, and they were all very nice. Yes, Sanderson's an excitable guy, but that's fine, um, and it was really fun to talk with him about the stuff he's passionate about. This is from Wired. Why would they put out something that someone so far just calling Sanderson lame? He sits across from me in an empty restaurant, kind of lordly and sure of his insights, in a graphic t-shirt and ill-fitting blazer, which he says he wears because it makes him look professorly. It doesn't, he isn't. This can't be real. This has got to be a joke, right? Unless the word means only believing everything you say is worth saying. Sanderson talks a lot, but almost none of it is usable, quotable. I begin to think this is what I drove all the way from San Francisco to the suburbs of Salt Lake City in the freezing cold dead of winter for, for previously frozen dim sum and freeze-dried conversation. This must be why nobody writes about Sanderson. 
let me put this very plainly and clearly. Uh, the reason Sanderson hasn't been written about a ton is because he has not been in the major Hollywood spaces. He has not directly had one of his stories adapted, and he has still become a gargantuan name. He's been on the Sunday shows and interviewed by some of the biggest names around to be interviewed by. Uh, this is a weirdly aggressive tone that is already insulting Mormons in general. It's insulting Salt Lake City and acting like being asked to descend from San Francisco to be amongst the people in Salt Lake City is such a burden. It's saying he doesn't sound professorly or look like a professor, when I'd argue he's one of the most famous professors in the world because his videos for his lectures get hundreds of thousands of views online. What the f is the point of this article? That this person was annoyed that their piece with Sanderson didn't go the way they wanted because he talked passionately about the stuff you went there to talk with him about? Are you on drugs? I... <sighs> Yeah, he speaks like he knows what he's talking about when he's talking about this stuff because guess what? He's one of the best-selling authors in this space who makes a full-time living outside of his publication talking about this space. I've, I've had the experience this person's talking about. I went and met with Sanderson. He was an incredibly sweet and generous host. This just seems mean. Weirdo Mormon. Like, what the fuck, man? So recklessly, I say what's on my mind. I have to. His wife is there. His biggest fan always his first reader making polite comments. I don't care. Maybe nobody writes about you, I say to Sanderson, because you don't write very well. Dude, his wife is there? His wife is an individual who's worth you talking about and talking to and understanding and listening to as her husband, who she's able to provide insight to, who you're there to learn about. This has got to be a joke. This can't be a real article. It's not that. Brandon Sanderson can't write. It's more that he can't not write. Graphomania is the name of a condition, the constant compulsion to get words out down as much as quickly as possible. The concept of vacations confuses Sanderson. He once said because for him, the perfect vacation is time to write. Vacation as vacation. So now we have the author of this article medically diagnosing Sanderson with something and then saying that something that I believe Sanderson said is a joke is real. His schedule is budgeted down to the minute, months out, to maximize the time he spends, rather counter ergonomically on the couch typing away. Most days he wakes up at 1 p.m., exercises, writes for four hours, breaks for the wife and kids, then writes for four more. He plays video games or whatever until 5 a.m. A powerful sleeping pill is all that works, finally to get him in the voices in his head to shut up. In the YouTube space, you see people take shots at people. You see people like be kind of mean and jerks, but there's usually a tone of like, we're doing this because it's part of the industry or we're doing this because like we're doing over the top opinions. This just seems like bullying. In the five months or so, it has taken me to sit down and write this magazine story, which is over 4,000 words long. Sanderson has published two books. During the COVID lockdown, he wrote and or edited seven, two for his regular publisher, a graphic novel, and four more in secret, telling no one but his wife until he surprise announced a Kickstarter in March 2020. We all know the story of that. Uh, since his debut, Elantris, in 2005, Sanderson has published 30-plus books, the biggest one in excess of 400,000 words. There are far more if you count the novellas and graphic novels and stuff for kids. I've read 17 of the actual books, or maybe it's 20. Exactitude is pointless here, as the major books are all set in the same verse, which Sanderson calls the Cosmere. They're all meant to blur together. Okay. There's a lot of jokes around Sanderson's writing, right? With how much he puts out. Anyone who actually knows what they're talking about will say it's because, yes, Sanderson writes really fast now. He didn't write as fast as he used to because back then he didn't have a team of people around him helping him. Sanderson has found a system that allows him to basically just continue to march through writing his stories and then able to go as fast as possible as people and his well-trained team behind him is setting him up. A lot of authors could write as fast as Sanderson if they had the level of success to have the team around Sanderson that he has. That is why he's able to write at this pace. It's a very simple setup. Yes, he is a fast writer in general, but the thing is a meme as well. 
It's not like he's actually superhumanly writing. If you break down the hours in the day and he's doing it as a full-time job, it's just success and discipline. I've criticized Sanderson in his past. I just covered the fact that, yeah, they kind of have dropped the ball in the shipping on uh, uh, Emerald Sea. But this is just someone who's basically being like, I went to meet this guy. I didn't like him. So... I'm going to go ahead and just shit on him. Like, what? Most will hear this and think, at that rate, none of the words can possibly be any good. They'd be right in a way, and that's what Sanderson agrees with, at the sentence level. He is no great gift for English prose. The early books especially, here's a sample sentence. It was going to be very bad this time. Another one, she felt a feeling of dread. There's a penchant for redundant description. A city is tranquil, peaceful, quiet. Many things from buildings to beasts are enormous. Sanderson definitely had, especially in his earlier writing, a lot of issues of prose. And he definitely also took some words out that just did not need to be there, uh, but he's improved since then. On almost every page of Misford, his first and probably most beloved series, a character sighs, frowns, raises an eyebrow, cocks a head, shrugs, or snorts. Sometimes at the same time, sometimes multiple times a page. I count seven books in which one of the characters frets about their metaphors. I have trouble with metaphors, one literally says of his own work. Sanderson has said, I detest rewriting. Uh, I write for endings and write to relax. It shows he writes by one metric at a sixth grade reading level. Uh, he did have rough prose earlier on, but that is something he has stated as well if you remove the context, which this person has done here, uh, so that his books are incredibly approachable, which is a commercial choice, so that way you can hit more people. Uh, and that's why he's driving his business. But this is also equating not having the best prose with saying <laughs> that the whole book is not worth reading or bad. There are books out there that are considered masterpieces that have incredibly simple prose because they deliver on other levels. Equating poor prose, which Sanderson admittedly can have, with just bad storytelling as a whole is a reach and then taking again a quote out of context for Sanderson saying I detest rewriting and applying it to all of his works when there are also bits from him out there where he is talking about like hey I would never release my high school novel because it's not up to par Sanderson has people who help him in editing and he still does actually do rewrites he's not claiming he's never ever ever done them Here's where I'll stop using Sanderson's words written or spoken against him. It's not fair. He's simply not, I'll say it again, very quotable. I spent days with the man. I watched his YouTube videos, made a dent in his podcast empire, most of it incredibly about writing. Like his books, it all blurs together. I typed some 40 pages of notes for this story, and who knows how many pages of transcripts the AI spat out when I fed the many hours of recorded audio. Now that I'm writing, I find I'm referring to none of it. Possibly this is the influence of Sanderson himself on me. Graph from Manny Kali, get thoughts down, have fun, write for the ending. So I will. This story has an ending, I promise, and I'm sprinting toward it, as if to a vacation. Like the best of Sanderson's endings, my ending should surprise you, because you see, Sanderson actually did say one thing to me, one miraculous thing that stuck, that I remember, these five months later. With perfect clarity, just seven words, but true ones. You're not ready for them just yet. How far up your own ass are you? You need more story first. For now, there is only Sanderson, both wordful and wordless. The best-selling writer no writer writes about because writers only know how to talk about words. Sanderson readers care about something else. This is the kind of person who I've dealt with before who would like take my dyslexia out of context to prove that like I'm a bad reader or something like that. Or they'd be like, oh, he's diagnosed with dyslexia. Cover none of me using dyslexia to motivate me to read more. And then like take me struggling reading out loud and be like, see, he's a f bad reader. And it's like, oh yeah, that's the kind of mentality, like the equivalent of what's been done to Sanderson here. I've genuinely never read anything like this before in my life. I have never read anything like this before. 10 seconds to go until the launch. The lights are flashing, the music thumping. This is sick, someone whispers behind me. A Cosmere worth of nerds count down the remaining seconds. 
At zero, an enormous applause. Then the VP of merchandising and events walks out. This is Dragonsteel 2020. I was there. The second convention of Sanderson's world and uh, worlds and works. Even though the con is being held in the biggest venue in downtown Salt Lake City, the Plaza Center, fans are turned away um, from panels left and right. The, uh, the first morning, I was panting by the time I reached the end of the line. Maybe work on your cardio. See, it's just weird mean insults taken out of context. Probably know you had to run five miles, but I'm not going to use the full context of that. And I'm going to say clearly you're an out of shape piece of shit. Like that's the equivalent of what's being done to Sanderson. Uh, you're what's wrong with like human conditions as a whole. Cause you haven't actually uh, taken the time to take care of your body, which is why the economy's in the trash. <laughs> For now, the fans, even the turned away ones are in inconquerable spirits as in typically the case are at these things. There's a general air, warmish body odor. Oh my God, of course we're taking shots at nerds for body odor and self-consciousness. By the way, I was there. I was at this dragon steel. I was amongst the people being crowded around as I was being recognized. And not one time did anyone smell bad, but that's just a, from a, in my perspective, uh, from someone who's clearly set an agenda to just be mean towards Sanderson and his fans an inaccurate observation because I have a sensitive nose. I was there. I was on panels. I was crowded. I was crowded around. And no, at no point did anyone just smell bad. I've been at conventions where things smell bad and this was not it. By my rough count, some three quarters of the attendees were men, boys, and man boys, blurring together in a mass of pale, fleshy nerds and Sanderson appropriate graphic tees. The women, fewer in number, tend to be the better cosplayers. Lots of billowing cloaks, Brightly makeups, precious weapons. I want to, again, like, I have a hard time saying this. I don't know what their experience was or where they were. There were a few people in mist cloaks and there were some people who did other cosplays. The vast majority were not in cosplay. The gender breakdown was a little more even in my experience, but like, I can't take shots of this because I, I, I don't know what room he was in when. It's just strange. Uh, I talked to as many of the fans as I can, some of their teens, others in their 60s. Yes, Sanderson's gathered an all-age range fan base here in Utah, as far away as India, Norway, Australia. They're sweet. Many of them have been reading Sanderson since the beginning. One guy from Massachusetts tells me he spent nearly $170 on a rubber sword. Uh, it's bigger than he is. He won't be able to take it on the plane home. Yeah, he's going to ship it. Uh, another guy, 41 years old, tells me he made his sword himself. Why? Like, well, yeah, he's going to ship it home, man. Like, he didn't buy it for the day. He's going to ship it to himself. That's normal. That's what people do with these things. Another guy, 40 years old, tells me he made his sword. Uh, it took him more than a year. Okay, a guy has a hobby and it makes him happy. Like, okay. Oh, he's terrible person. He has a hobby. It made him happy. Oh my God. One question I ask practically everyone is why Sanderson? I only need to ask it a few times to realize the answer is always the same. It's a two-parter. First part, Sanderson's characters. I feel like real people, everyone says. Multiple parents say they've named their kids after their favorite, usually the uh, princely protagonists who've overcome various depressions and triumph chivalry. I've done some things I'm not proud of, one man tells me. He then read Stormlight Archive, The Way of Kings, and now reformed. He has a two-year-old son named Kaladin. Uh, that's all. Oh my God, guess what? After Twilight came out, there were more Bellas and Edwards. Holy sh Go Yeah, literally this guy went to a Sanderson convention and thought, why Sanderson? <laughs> like... Also, I was asking similar questions of people here, and I got a very different set of answers. Here's a f***ing mind-blowing idea for the author of this article. Maybe you're rather unapproachable, and you got repeating answers from people because you were asking them a rather dumb question at a convention, surrounded by the stories that are literally the answer to your why, and also not a lot of people are good at just answering questions on the spot when someone's walking up to them and just asking I have had to take a classes and debate and rhetoric to be able to speak in front of people and answer questions. Even I am very uncomfortable when someone just comes up to me in person and asks me like, hey, are you Daniel Green? It gets weird. I don't know how to answer that in person. It's called social f***ing anxiety. And yeah, you're at a convention where that condition, a little more common. Oh my God. A second answer to why Sanderson, in his words, this is probably what is he's best known for, world building. Yeah, he's really good at world building. Sometimes cities, sometimes whole planets with rulers, systems, politics, and then he populates them with characters whose fates are also the worlds. So second character is just the inverse of the first. No, that's literally you're saying, okay, there's one element of these two things tied together. Therefore, no, you can't have uh, world building without character building. Yes, you can. <laughs> some characters die, some become gods. The good ones and most of them are good are very good, inspiringly good, not true. 
Kaladin is very debatably not a good person. <laughs> uh, I would say there are many... Adolin. Sorry, spoilers for Stormlight Archive. <laughs> like, what? Uh, they only save lives. You didn't read the book! What? They only save lives? Then puts her head through a person! What? <laughs> Delinar is a war criminal who burned his alive! Sorry for the spoilers. Sorry for the spoilers. But are you kidding me? This is someone who just said with their chest, oh, by the way, I did not read any of the books I'm criticizing, by the way. So the second answer is just the inverse of the first. The good ones, most of them are all are good, are very good. No, most of his characters are not good, inspiringly good. Absolutely not. No one has sex. That is also, he does the fade to black type thing that Jordan does, but he doesn't do explicit sex scenes. That's a stylistic choice. What nobody, not a single person complains about in my two days walking the pla place for is Sanderson's writing. If they mention his sentence at all, it is merely to acknowledge they're easier to read than, say, Tolkien's. Objectively not true. Again, I was there, and it was also a very critical of Sanderson at time convention. Just, I had a different experience. I can't attest to what this person did. But more so than other conventions I've been to, there were people with complaints, and there were questions asked during panels that were, like, a little bit combative. I... I can't attest to it aside from that. Still, I can't, can't help but try to trip them up. Oh, okay, so he's just admitting I'm trying to just be a dick. Surely he's not a great writer, I prod, polite, embarrassed smiles. They're suspicious of me, I can tell. You have some kind of social issue, my guy. Imagine going to a convention, having people, someone saying like, no, I'm just a fan, and then being like, but he's a bad writer, right? And they look at you like, no, I'm good. And then you're like, you're Suspicious of me. I've infiltrated their ranks. <laughs> I even like Kaladin. The scene midway through Way of Kings where Kaladin talks to a mysterious stranger. It's Hoyt. Okay, so I was putting spoilers in the article, which I know I just spoiled some stuff. Sorry. On Shattered Plains, a story doesn't live until it's imagined in someone's mind. Hoyt says, do I know th what that means? Not exactly. And that's exactly why I read science fiction and fantasy. Why I've pretty much only read science fiction and fantasy my entire life. For those who play at profundity, at the essence of storytelling, storytelling beyond words. What am I saying? Gibberish, most likely. Uh, Sanderson is a bad writer. I've said it. Uh, here at the convention, most of the panelists aren't even writers. People don't care about sentences. They care about Sanderson. I sit through multiple panels where the future of his publishing company, which is called, as is the convention, you'll note, Dragonsteel. Post Kickstarter campaign, the company is now 50 some people Mormon strong. This is the year of Sanderson, the panelists keep saying. Yeah, it's a marketing tool. Uh, it's the same way that we saw Paolini literally just say it's the year of Paolini. Four new books with special swag for backers, new toys and sparkly bookmarks. Now they're talking about warehouse expansion efforts. Yes, he is very transparent with his company, which a lot of fans appreciate. Now they're talking about a possible future bookstore housed in a castle or something. Again, dismissive, insulting tone. When will the Dragonsteel Amusement Park be built? Someone asked the audience hoots. All I can think to myself is not the spirit of fantasy. If it's world building, it's only world building. One thing, the world builder's world. Anyway, three days later, I pull up to Sanderson's built world, his home in a gated community of American folk, Utah. There are three properties. On the left is the newest one, the subterranean man cave, unofficially known as the supervillain lair. Dragon Shields HU, props and merch bookstores, specifically the Elantra Suite. It has cover art from the books on the walls, gold and silvery uh, frilly things everywhere, and the world's best shower. So Sanderson has, it's not my personal taste either, but it's Sanderson's and I'm not gonna judge him. It's called a subjective aesthetic choice. Also, I do have one of my own book covers on my wall. I am very proud of it. I'm proud of my work. I guess I'm a terrible person now. All right. Uh, I'm already knew about the shower because a few nights earlier, I'd gone out for drinks with a friend of Sanderson's. I met at the con after contextualizing Sanderson's success memory. Basically, he gives fans exactly what they want. She insisted I stay the night in the Elantra suite and you have to try the shower, she said. I'll text him. The next morning, I woke up to an invitation from his assistant. So they were extremely hospitable. That is nice of them. Sanderson's assistant is his wife's sister. As I orient myself within the Cosmere house, I keep running into his nearest and dearest, his, doppelganger's bro his doppelganger brother, multiple siblings-in-law, neighbors, people's children, friends Sanderson formed a writer's group with almost 30 years ago back in college at Birmingham University. Uh, Brigham Young University. When he was a nobody and worked the graveyard shift at a hotel so he could write the nights away, Dragon Steals a company, one that's sh shaking up the book industry. It's also Sanderson's extended family. I'm a little nervous about them saying all of that because it actually sounded really nice, but this article earlier on was insulting Mormonism and saying all kinds of like mean stuff about Sanderson's 
private life and like habits and personality. So now I'm like, okay, what are you going to say that's awful about them? Um, by the way, it's not unheard of when you're running your own smaller company to hire people near you. Kayla basically helps run my company now, my significant other. That happens. Okay. The writer's group still meets every Friday, which uh, it is what today happens to be. It's the most PG gathering of writer types I've ever been to. There are chips and sodas. Yeah, they're in Mormon country, man. Someone baked an apple crisp. Uh, before the meetup kicks off, I corner some regulars in the kitchen. Even the way he writes about how he approaches for questions, it's like, and then I got them. <laughs> they're gossiping, uh, uh, cracking jokes. One dragon steals new head of narrative. Let's slip that Sanderson feels no pain. It's true. Sanderson's sister-in-law says, even though he writes for eight hours a day on a couch, he has no back aches. The hottest of hot sauces uh, causes scarcely a sweat. And we also that video. At the dentist, he refuses Novocaine for fillings. When I ask Sanderson later to confirm this, he does, but asks if I really have to print it. I'm sorry, I say, I really do. No, you don't, man. What the fuck? So you literally were told something not by Sanderson about him, Something that he's clearly a little bit self-conscious about and has zero relevance to anything else you've said in the article. And now you're like, nah, I got to say this thing that makes you look weird. The writer's group is standard stuff. What's the character motivation? Can the reader follow the fight scene? Sanderson gives feedback uh, with half his brain. The other half occupied with autographing books. No, uh, I've done autographing. You can fully focus on what you're saying. It becomes rote. This is just him, again, making assumptions, being an ass. And I, if you watch Sanderson answer questions during his streams, he is insanely articulate. And, and now I'm coming across too defensive of Sanderson, someone who I usually try and maintain a very center stance on, because this is just coming across as actual bullying to me. If only afterward the real talk happens, such as Star Wars debates. When those subside, I bring up the pain thing again. Okay, wonderful. So Sanderson made it clear something he was uncomfortable with talking about. You then bring up around people. You're a wonderfully pleasant person, it sounds like. Turns out Sanderson doesn't feel a lot of pain of any kind, even emotional. On roller coasters, he's dead-faced. While his wife is shrieking. It's sick and wrong, she says, smiling, so she's trying to be lighthearted about it. She, li uh, she likes to say she married an android. For his part, Sanderson actually, at this moment, looked pained. He might not feel, he says, but his characters do. They agonize and cry and rejoice in love. That's one of the reasons he writes, he says, to feel human. Seems like you're taking very sensitive things Sanderson might not have wanted to put out and after he explicitly told you not to, putting them in your article for clicks. What is the point of this article? I will ask again. The conversation eventually turns to a theme park called Evermore, located just downtown the street. Though unaffiliated with Sanderson, it's Sandersonian at the core. You show up, hang around taverns, embark on quests. We have to go, I say, but it's falling apart, everyone groans. Something to do with bad management. There's a four-hour YouTube video all about it. Yeah, uh, Nicholson did a great deep dive into it. Still, Sanderson seems tempted. We leave it at that. I go back to the Elantra suite where I finally take the sh that shower. There are multiple shower heads. I turn everything on. Water hits me from every angle. I don't cry, but I could. Why? What about this is like... I could cry right now. Um, you then link a YouTube video, which is actually a very comprehensive breakdown. And then <laughs> the, to finish it all off, you don't actually make any comparisons to the thing you're trying to insult him with, with any context. You just say it, leave it, move on, and then compliment his shower and say you could cry. What did Sanderson do to you? I don't understand. I do cry the next night, my last in Utah. We're down in Sanderson's below ground movie theater in plush red leather seats that are not only recline but also have adjustable headrests. He wants to show the specs off. Yeah, people show off their home theaters. I've been there, he showed it to me. It's incredibly nice. It's a bit over the top for my personal taste. It's not what I would do, but Sanderson's a fantastic fantasy, you know, go over the top kind of guy and it fits his vibe. And he makes crazy amounts of money so he can afford it. He plays the opening scene of The Greatest Showman. I don't tell him that while I like musicals. I hate The Greatest Showman, especially Hugh Jackman. Why didn't you tell him that? Human beings, when someone asks, hey, could I show you how this sounds and stuff with this movie? One, he's not asking you to pay attention to the movie. He's asking you to pay attention to the pet technical aspects. So like, that's not even relevant to what he's asking you. But if you detest The Greatest Showman enough to bring it up in your article as a point of contention, why didn't you, like a normal human being with social skills, go, oh, could you choose another movie? I just really have a thing against Hugh Jackman. When the scene starts, the chair shakes with the otherworldly sound. When Hugh Jackman, lame Hugh, opens his mouth to sing, I can't help it, I burst into tears. <laughs> what the f Imagine being like, hey, this guy who's been really weird the whole time he's been here. Uh, I'm going to try and, you know, we'll just get through a little bit more time in his last night. I'll play him a movie. 
he keeps asking people and bringing up stuff I asked him not to, but we'll just we'll watch some Hugh Jackman. I'm gonna hit play. And then the guy next to you just starts weeping. <laughs> No additional thoughts into Sanderson, who I have met. I definitely have issues with some of the things he's done in his past. I've seen, I think Sanderson's grown as a person, still has flaws. You know, I think he has flaws as an author. I don't think he's perfect, but I don't think he's an awful human being hurting anybody. This guy is saying that Sanderson pushed him to the point of tears because he showed him Hugh Jackman. <laughs> What's happening to me? The story isn't coming together. To my mind, I still haven't gotten anything real from Sanderson, anything true. What are you talking about? I'm not the first person he has tor toured around his lair to politely gawk at his treasures and trophies and his hallway of custom stained glass renditions of his favorite books. I'm certainly not the first person he has told about the f his one favorite book in particular, Bar uh, Barbara Hambly's Dragon's Bane, which an English teacher put in his hands when he was 14. Sounds like Sanderson is giving you a deep insight into things that mean a lot to him that any competent writer could use to then talk about in a regular piece, talking about someone like Sanderson, the full context of their growth and journey as a writer and how he was brought into one of the biggest franchises of all time at a young age. And he managed to actually deliver something that fans of that series, which was by a different author, often then say was really solid. But no, 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 you're gonna make it this weird twisted this rich guy made me look at his stuff. Bro, no one's surprised Sanderson is rich. Probably the day he became a fantasy writer or how he first got published or at the f about the phone call he got from Robert Jordan's widow asking me might finish the Wheel of Time series. We are now almost at the end of this article, judging by the sidebar over here, and he's just brought up the origins of Sanderson's writing career. And we have spent paragraph after paragraph just making awkward social observations one woman i talked to at the con made sure to tell me which of sanderson pets were her favorite it's jello the parrot i like i don't trust this author to the point now because they've been so clearly just so bent on painting sanderson as a negative a light possible i'm pretty sure what happened is a fan was just like i like the parrot and this is the way the guy has decided to write it. Like, this is a very important lesson on why writing as a journalist is extremely important uh, to, like, come across non-biased. Because if you want to use an example that could be a bit weird and something about fandom culture and toxic, if all you've done is just bend over backwards to paint everything as negatively as you can, I'm just going to assume you're the dick in this situation once again. No, I, okay, I'm going to be honest. I don't like the parrot. That might be the... I don't like Sanderson's bird. I don't like birds in general. They're noisy, and I think they're gross. There. That, now you know I'm being honest. <laughs> After I recover from Hugh in 4D, Sanderson collects his 15-year-old and we all and we all drive to dinner. Uh, this time the food is better. Utah Japanese. Sanderson and I order ramen. He salts his. Then I watch his son salt his yolk. Why are you talking about what Sanderson's son is doing to his meal? Why? Just because you don't like the family? <sighs> I could cry again. Instead, I ask Sanderson if he's ever, uh, if he's ever, ever so moved by a scene he writes, he cries. Sometimes, he says, though it might not be the scenes people expect. He won't say more, but it's something. This conversation from five months ago, I can remember. I recall fairly clearly. Why did it take you five months to get this article out? Uh, why is this the one thing you remember? We're heading towards something now. Some kind of admission. I can feel it. When Mormons ask God for a sign, they speak of a burning in the bosom. Uh, say you're a kid wondering if you should be a fantasy writer when you grow up. You might ask God what he thinks. <laughs> if there's a burning in your bo bosom, that's probably a yes. So I press Sanderson on the moments he has felt the burning. He says he's they're too intimate, too special to talk about. Once again, that is Sanderson politely telling you, hey, I know you're here to do a piece on me. Not that personal. Not something I'm comfortable talking about. You're asking someone to tell you a stranger who they're probably not getting good vibes from, to tell you the most intimate moments they've had as a person. No. That's fine, then let's talk about Mormonism in another way. Let's talk about as it relates to fantasy. Oh no. Because it's no secret, Mormonism is the fantasy of religion, the science fiction edition of Christianity, with its angels and alternative histories embodies gods, visions, and plates made of gold. I asked Sanderson if I've got the ultimate purpose of the religion right, the ultimate promise, uh, sorry, ultimate promise, being, as I understand it, that we uh, humans will, if we're good and marry well, and memorize the passcode, eventually pass into the highest kingdom and come into our divine inheritance. We'll become gods, in other words, and get our own planets. I cannot stress enough how much memorize the passcodes tells you everything you need to know about this writer. I am not, as I've said, 
pro-Mormon and their preaching, their religion, their beliefs. I'm bi. They obviously, I got beef with a lot of what they do. But if you are trying to make a point, if you are trying to come across as objective and someone who has observations that to be respected, this tells you everything you need to know right there. Because, yes, I find, perfectly frankly, quite a bit of Mormonism to be goofy when I've looked into it. I have kind of chuckled at it behind my hand at times. Not going to deny that, but I've done that with basically every single religion out there. I think all of them have equally goofy shit going on. Um, I know that Sanderson in the past has also made homophobic comments, which he has walked back and said, hey, I'm really sorry. And I genuinely, generally, am very hesitant to believe someone's gotten over their homophobia, but I also like to believe people can change and grow. So I personally have decided to be like, okay, Sanderson has said he's grown. He started doing a lot better LGBTQ plus rep in his books. So until I see reasons not to respect his growth as an individual, I tend to believe him and hope that he can affect change from within inside the church. Wonderful. That's my stance on that. If you are coming in to someone's faith and asking them about it, and either he is lying in the article and the way he phrased this to Sanderson is entirely different than he phrased it here. And he was being two-faced to him to then insult him behind his back to us, the reader. Or he did phrase it like this to Sanderson and Sanderson had to bite his tongue and be like, yeah, that's the gist of it. And like, that's, this is literally, if you read between the lines, if you have reading comprehension, you can tell what kind of awkward encounter this either had to be or how the author is misrepresenting it. Sanderson doesn't balk at the characterization. He agrees that's the gist and he knows where I'm going. He knows I want to know if what he's doing writing fantasy books is fundamentally in some way, some very central way, Mormon. Of course it is, he says, the world building, the gods, incarnate, the system of magic. So much of Mormonism is about rules. So are his books, where miracles don't happen unless you put in the work. That's when between mouthfuls of pork cutlet, again, just trying to be like, ah, oh, putting the image of Sanderson talking with his mouthful uh, in front of you. Sanderson makes a connection between his work and the works of his heavenly father explicit. I just don't believe the author at this point. Why would I? I, one, I don't think it'd be a problem for Sanderson to relate his faith to his work, whatever. But it's gotten to the point where I just don't trust this person is going to categorize whatever Sanderson said in a similar context to which Sanderson actually said it. This is when he speaks the seventh word, seven words of truth, the only ones I am certain he has ever said in quite this way. As I build books, Sanderson says, as I sit there for once entirely enraptured, God builds people. We officially have a response from Sanderson. I feel the need to cut in at this point because I find it to be rather uh, contextualizing to a lot of what I've said. First of all, he responded to the post of the article in one of his subreddits with, I guess because I admitted to him I'm not a person who feels pain very easily, he thought he should see how deep the knife would go. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, and then more interestingly, in his second response, when ask, someone asked for clarification about the line, as I build books, God builds people, Sanderson responds, maybe when he came for a second round at the Japanese dinner, it was he was really interested in the Mormon angle. He pushed over and over and just circling back. I think I was just talking about how I like that humans are naturally creative, that making things up brings us joy. I have to I have talked about this before in speeches, how I talk, how I think all jobs are creative in some way, not just traditionally creative jobs. I mentioned this seems to be an echo of deity in the U.S. God created the world and we as people like to create. My creative outlets is books. Is books. It's ironic that this made the story for him as I don't really remember that point well. <laughs> um, so there's Sanderson's view on this. I, I would love to know the true context of that sentence and what Sanderson was actually saying, because maybe Sanderson did say something kind of weird that could strike anyone as odd, but the author of this article has in no way, shape or form set that up or, or earned the reader's trust to, I don't know, whatever. We descend on one final world. After dinner, it's time for Evermore, the rundown theme park. The night is misty and cold. <sighs> I remember one of Sanderson's friends saying the park is only open at night to conceal the decay. I believe it. As we walk around, Sanderson narrates, 
Uh, those are bad prosthetics. The, it's half a costume. Shouldn't be there for more skeletons in this dungeon. At least the apple cider is good. I really believe from how this author has come across socially, they probably took him there to just try and get time to pass until he's going to go fly back to his holy land in San Francisco. He gets recognized by everybody. I guess that's inevitable when you go to a fantasy land with a fantasy legend. Yes, who has literally just purchased a $5 million plot of land across the way for who knows what world building reasons. Are we not supposed to like that a rich guy has money? Again, I'm as left as they come, but this is like that kind of miscategorization of being leftist where it's like you're against all rich people. No, Sanderson's rich, he's building a company, he's employing people and he's making things happen. I'm fine with all of that. And this is just being like, you know that guy who made $40 million? Well, guess what? He made $40 million. Who I just, how is this article real? Sanderson and I, Sanderson's son and I start keeping a silent tally. Every time a new fan walks over, we hold up fingers behind Sanderson's back. We quickly run out of fingers. One girl says she wants to take Sanderson's writing class at BYU, and she grows up a surprising number of guys ask for autographs for my girlfriend. Lots of people having already finished his latest book, which came out like yesterday. Sanderson shines in these situations. He's your god, but he's your friend too. Okay, people look up to him and he's very personable, and you decide to phrase it as he's your god, but he's your friend too. Too. <laughs> I thought nobody knew who he was, man. <laughs> He's also unafraid to drop hints about future projects. Yeah, he's very open about that. He does this to me at certain points. Will they ever make a big movie version of one of his books? I ask him in a fair, uh, fairy garden. Sanderson makes meaningful noises, even though your systems of magic seem uh, unfilmably complex. I have never heard anyone say that about any of Sanderson's magic systems. I have heard people say it about Malazan, but I have heard only ever people say Sanderson's magic systems are extremely filmable because they have literally by design hard rules that you can easily understand with visible means. That is just a stupid thing to say. More meaningless noises. My guy. I am just imagining Sanderson having given this person so much who has then consistently pushed for more, having to, after a certain point of questioning, be like, I, yeah, man, <laughs> that's, this is, this is, we're at the end, by the way. This is the conclusion. Everything's been optioned, he says, but then things revert and discussions continue. I suspect there will be big announcements soon. There have to be. Sanderson is bigger than ever. A good writer? Who knows? Apparently you know, and your conclusion, your very direct conclusion was no. You can't backtrack that now. What do I know now? This is... So many of us mistake sentences for story, but story is the thing. Things happen. Characters changing. Surprise endings. As I drive us back to the house, drop off the kid, and then stay in the car with Sanderson a bit longer, talking about life, talking about worlds, my ending takes shape. The surprise is that it was Sanderson's ending all along. The ending of his best books. A character becomes a god, and the god beholds his planet below. If Sanderson is a writer, that is all he is doing. He is living his fantasy godhead on Earth. You know how earlier in the article... This person commented on a line from Hoyd thematically out of context that within the context of the book they then proved they didn't read actually does make sense. But their criticism of it was like, it, it doesn't make sense and it's just saying nothing and it's stupid. This person has reached so desperately to try and paint Sanderson as like a hollow, egotistical person who doesn't feel things and is a bad writer and built up their own ending as being this kind of like reflection of a Sanderlanch, as the fans call it. And in reality, <laughs> he said nothing. He just said that, yes, Sanderson has a big enough impact now to get what he wants in terms of building things, and he has fans. And clearly the writer is not personally a fan of his writing if he read any of it at all. But like, my guy, you've done exactly what you've accused being. There's not actually any real commentary on Sanderson's character. You just didn't f get along with him. I have thought I should be harder on Sanderson in some ways in the past because I have issues with some angles of his faith, right? And I have some issues with like some of his writings in terms of his prose being a bit simplistic. But I've often also felt that Sanderson gets way too much shit at times for his prose. And also there's this weird perverse need from some of his critics to drag his faith into his writing. 
and they'll take broad thematic elements and try and pull, you know, comparisons as a way to then insult either Mormonism or Sanderson. And this is the clearest example of it I've ever seen. They never, and there are absolutely things to criticize about Mormonism. They have done none of that. They didn't bring up any actual of the issues with Mormonism. And they just like, just shit on things and then walked away as if they made a point. I am flabbergasted that this got put out by Wired. It's not a puff piece. It's not even an opinion piece. It doesn't tell you much about Sanderson or his writing. It's just mean. This was like a desperate attempt to get some notoriety from John Jason Kehe here by just making as many people angry as possible. And it's so transparent and pathetic that it actually just made me think a little tiny smidgen higher of Sanderson, who I have a mixed opinion of for a lot of reasons, but due respect as a person and has only ever been a very cordial host to me. But it's made me think a little bit even higher of him because I can't imagine it was pleasant to host this person. And it sounds like he was still managed to be very friendly to him. 